everybody, Julian Charles here of TheMindRenewed.com, coming to you as usual from the depths of the Lancashire countryside here in the UK. And today it's my great pleasure to welcome to the programme Dr Mitch Stokes, who is a Senior Fellow of Philosophy at New St Andrews College in Moscow, Idaho. Dr Stokes teaches graduate courses in philosophy and mathematics and logic to undergraduates. And uh, what sparked my interest in his work? Uh, the fact that he studied under an enviable collection of philosophy philosophical and theological heroes of mine, completing an MA in philosophy of religion at Yale under no less a figure than Nicholas Walterstorff, and an MA in philosophy at the University of Notre Dame, and in 2005 completed a PhD in philosophy at Notre Dame under the world-renowned Alvin Plantinga and Peter van Inwagen. And as if that were not enough, he also holds degrees in mechanical engineering and holds five patents in something called, um, I think if I can even pronounce this, uh, aeroderivative gas turbine technology, which uh, I've got to, I haven't, I haven't really got a clue about that. I'm going to have to ask what that is in a minute. Um, Dr. Stokes, thanks very much for joining us on the show. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Well, today we're going to be talking about your new book, which I have here on the desk, published earlier this year by Crossway, which has the, um, well, let's say the unexpected title for a book published by a Christian publisher, How to Be an Atheist. And uh, I mentioned this to the the listeners to TMR a couple of weeks ago. I mentioned uh, that you were coming on the show. And I said that, well, that sounds a bit like a manual for how to live life to the full as an atheist. Um, But having actually read it, it it, uh, isn't that. Your your subtitle reveals much more uh, why many skeptics aren't skeptical enough. And I'm going to say that it's a book that I very much enjoyed. It deals with a lot of issues raised by atheists and skeptics, super skeptics and and the like in the areas of science and uh, morality in particular, science and morality, with respect to the belief in God. And I think it does so in a way that is substantial. And yet I think it's very approachable and actually very amusing as well. Um, And I want to ask you about your sense of humor in a bit. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Because I'm wondering whether you've been influenced by Alvin Plantinga, but I'll I'll ask you about that in a minute. Um, Let's put that book aside just for a moment and turn to you. So the first question I have is, how did you come to have degrees in engineering as well as philosophy? Well, I started out as an engineer. Um, It was in my while I was doing my master's in mechanical, I mean, I've always been a pretty skeptical, just that's my temperament and um, always had questions and, and particularly about my faith. So while I was doing graduate work in engineering, I'm trying to reconcile science with theism, Christianity in, in particular, and just was having the most difficult time. And it wasn't just science. It was just, you know, other philosophical issues uh, when it came to Christianity and just struggling with all of that. And so really came to a crisis point. You know, I got to where I really couldn't pray. I was like, I couldn't read the Bible without always, how is that really true? Yeah. I mean, it was just, it was crippling. And um, the church that I was going to, actually quite a number of my friends were going to seminary at the time, uh, Reformed Theological Seminary in Orlando. Uh, this is in Florida. And they were, it was just great. They just said, hey, look, you know, you're not the only one who has thought about these things, struggled, grappled with them, and they started giving me books. And I just couldn't believe it. I was like, oh my goodness, that's, I mean, it was just, it was such a far cry from how I, you know, when I would ask questions earlier, I would get more of the answers like, well, I'm just glad I believe you know it was, i was right it was, yeah. would this be in a in your church context you'd actually ask a pastor or something like that what, what, what? yeah not so much the pastors but maybe just the people i knew and like i'd say hey i'm i have a question about this or what do you think about this and they would get really uncomfortable but in this new environment they really just accepted i mean just being allowed to ask the questions was enormous. I mean, that made all the difference. And then finding that there were actually some good answers to my questions was obviously a big plus as well. Yeah, yeah. So can I just ask which particular authors you were influenced by at that time? Uh, I mean, at the beginning, the big ones were, uh, I don't know if you've heard of Hugh Ross. I have actually, yeah. Hugh Ross, 
Uh, Ravi Zacharias was a big influence at the time. And then, well, once I started to reconcile some of these bigger picture questions, I ended up taking courses part time at the seminary just to learn more and got into apologetics that way and then ended up eventually quitting my engineering job and going back to school and studying philosophy. And then that's when I went to Yale and then Notre Dame. Mm-hmm. And by that time, when I was in seminary, the, by that time we were studying, you know, I knew about Nick Waltersdorf and Planiga and just, they were kind of the gurus. And so we, I remember always thinking, man, could you imagine studying with these guys? Yeah. And so it was just a, kind of like this pipe dream. Mm. So what is Alvin Plantinga like? I mean, uh, presumably you got on with him well. I mean, he seems very laid back when he, he appears in public. Is he like that in person? He is. He's just really affable and gracious and kind, and he's a wonderful guy. And he was still, I mean, he may still rock climb, but he was an avid rock climber, you know, into his, you know, late 70s. He may still, he's in his 80s, I think, now. And I think he may, he may still rock climb. I mean, he was just in amazingly good shape, just a, Yeah, he was an impressive man all around. (laughs) And did you get on with Walter Storff and Van Inwagen as well? Yeah, they were, all of them were just fantastic. You know, very different personalities, very different philosophical temperaments. And so that was really nice to see. I still pinch myself. I think I really just, I got to sit under these guys and just, you know, I'm in their office and they're being able to have these long discussions and taking courses from them and getting this one-on-one attention. It was just, yeah, it was really undeserved and certainly very, very appreciated. Well, that's very humble of you. I'm sure it wasn't uh, undeserved. Um, Just coming back to your previous life, as it were, in uh, engineering, what actually is aeroderivative gas turbine technology? And I've been practicing that, so I can say it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it was um, a gas turbine is basically just a jet engine. And so what we did, we took the jet engine technology and applied it to basically enormous jet engines used to power electrical generators. And these engines could be the size of a like a trailer or a mobile home. They're just enormous jet engines. You know, they wouldn't be used on a plane by any stretch. And so we would take the the advanced technology that people like General Electric or Rolls-Royce in England were using. We actually worked with Rolls-Royce in England for a while on some aeroderivative stuff. And we would just take their technology and adapt it to power generation. Interesting. Do you think that your connection there with science and mathematics and engineering gave you a particular sensitivity to the kinds of things that are said in the media where, you know, you up get some atheist scientist who's, who's very well known and uh, make some points against theism? Do you think you were particularly susceptible to being influenced by what they had to say because of your background? Well, it's funny. I think probably initially I would have been susceptible to influence and then having that background and actually doing, you know, I, what was nice about my engineering job is it wasn't just technology. It was also science. So we're trying to come up with new, new way, you know, how the world is working and how, you know, when it comes to fluid mechanics and combustion and all, and all of that. And then we got to apply it. So I, I got to use some, you know, it was really high tech and I also got to do a lot of fairly technical, actually highly technical, um, laboratory work. So it was theoretical and practical. So I really got a good feel for how science and technology proceeds. And so having that background and then then starting to see how some atheists were, the claims that they were making for science and how confident they were. And I'm thinking, oh, come on, have you never done science? I mean, it's really, there's a lot of art to it. And, and that's one of the things I try to point out in the book is that, and this isn't to, this, this is actually to help us appreciate science more. It's very, very difficult. The fact that scientists can do what they do is stunning. You know, they really are heroes in many respects. They should be appreciated. So making science seem like, oh yeah, you just follow these laws and you read theories off of the data and then you just read conclusions off of the mathematical theories that's not you know that's actually an insult to scientists so the background helped me to see through 
some of the, um, you know, I guess there's a cockiness that comes from some scientists who are atheists. I never understood that given that they had a, you know, if you have a scientific mind, you know, to be a little bit you know, skeptical. Hmm. Because I think it's somewhere in the book you say that there are certain people who who are I can't think of the exact phrase, but something like they're engaged in a, a sophisticated form of lying or something like that. Um, yeah, I don't. Um, I mean, there seems like there's kind of this bluster, mm. and you know, I I would appreciate. Um, I think atheists, and this is this is maybe just some practical advice. If you're much more measured in your claims. I'll be much more likely to listen to you. So someone like Thomas Nagel, he's an atheist who's very aware of the limits of science and philosophy. He's a great, he's a great philosopher, um, but he's much more cautious about his claims. And when I know that someone is cautious, I know they know what they're talking about, and I'm much more likely to be influenced and listen to what they say. So, you know, I think atheists would, if they could take a, page out of someone like Nagel's book, they would be more effective. I mean, not, it sounds like I'm, uh, Hey, here's a, here's a way, but I, but I do think that I think it would benefit everyone if we were just honest about certainty and uncertainty instead of all of the blustering rhetoric. And I think Christians can do that too. You know what I mean? I think there's a lot of overstated confidence and overstated positions that just muddies the water and makes it into a fight more than a conversation. Mm-hmm. Well, absolutely. A lot of this comes over very clearly in your book. And you you mentioned Thomas Nagel. And in fact, you say that he's been heavily criticized, actually, for being more open in uh, the way he approaches this debate. So perhaps in some ways, that wouldn't be good advice for somebody to follow him. But (laughs) (laughs) it depends how you look at it, of course. Yeah, Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I guess for as as far as your atheist career, that might not might not go so well. Um, So really, just before we actually talk specifically about the book, I mean, one foundational question I want to ask you is then how do you see the relationship between faith and reason? Now, I know this is a massive question and you do deal yeah. with it. In in a sense, you're dealing with it throughout the book, but just to sort of prime the pump, um, you know, somebody like Richard Dawkins will say belief in God is you know, essentially blind faith. It's got n- nothing to do with reason, hardly anything to do with reason, let's say. Whereas others like you know, some apologists will say, well, belief in God must be founded upon evidences and rigorous arguments. And so what's your view on this? How do you, as it were, navigate between those two extremes? Yeah, I, the way I approach it is to look at how we reason generally, and even even looking at the way science, you know, the scientific method, and there really is no the scientific method, but just looking at how do we reason about some of our most, I mean, even the things that we would all agree on, like there's a, here there's a computer in front of me. You know, I mean, no one would doubt that. And so, well, let's look at some of these obvious cases of belief and obvious cases of inference when it comes to scientific, you know, things that we all agree on. And that, once you see how reasoning works and you look at epistemology and the study of knowledge and you see how beliefs are formed and how they're justified, it gives you a much better picture. You know, I think you have to do that spade work first before you start talking about faith and reason because, well, what do you mean by faith? What do you mean by reason? And I think sometimes those yeah. that that conversation is already posed Usually, if you haven't studied that, there it's usually posed with this feel, this gut, this intuition for what faith and reason already are, and I think that biases the conversation in a in a bad direction. So the bottom line is to look at reasoning in general and see, all right, what sorts of things do we assume? What sorts of things do we take for granted? What sorts of things do we infer? What sorts of evidence do we use, and how do we measure them? And looking at that, and that's what I try to do in the book. And you know, it might sound like, oh gosh, that sounds terrible, but it really is absolutely fundamental. And often I'll use the, I'll just use scientific reasoning as a test case because it really is just ordinary reasoning, but done in a more systematic way. So it makes it a little neater. And then, but then you find that it's not that neat. And so then that, that affects your faith and your relationship between faith and reason and what that is. And I think, you know, Christian beliefs are just 
they're not entirely different from, say, scientific beliefs. They're beliefs, and we need to figure out, well, what sorts of things are we allowed to assume, what sorts of things are we can't assume or take for granted, and in what contexts. I sp- Yeah, I suppose in a way I should have uh, asked you that question at the end, because you're quite right, throughout the book you're, you're grappling with this all the way, and you're kind of um, nuancing those terms so that we, we can get some idea of how to f- formulate such a question. Um, so I, maybe I'll come back at the end and ask you the same question. <laughs> um, yeah, maybe, sure. or I don't know. Um, so turning to your book then, How to Be an Atheist, sure. I think the best way to sum it up is essentially what's printed on the back, so I will read that, which is, quote, atheists talk a lot about the importance of scepticism, but the truth is they're not nearly sceptical enough. So could you tell us why? Why aren't sceptics as sceptical as they should be very often? What are you getting out there? Well, one thing just to back up, as far as the book is concerned, what you know, the strategy and the goal of the book isn't to convince someone that atheism is wrong. I don't argue. I mean, I do this to some degree, but it's much more, I'm much more um, concerned with, look, okay, you want to be skeptical. Well, that's great. I'm, I want to be skeptical too. And I, but I think we need to figure out, well, what does it mean to be skeptical? And, and so I'm not trying to give arguments for theism, though I think there's certainly that's in the ballpark. Um, but when you start studying epistemology and the in science and how sci- and the philosophy of science, and you really just start to see how the areas in which we can be certain and the areas in which we can't be certain. And I think if you took your skeptical principles seriously, it would turn down the, the volume on the rhetoric and allow us to just calmly talk about these things. And that, and that goes for all of us, either side of a, of, of a debate. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, us, yeah, us too, us too. And I think that's, that's a huge, and that's something that I'm still trying to learn how to do, you know, because one of the things that you, you know, my dedication to, you know, I have this loyalty to Jesus, but at the same time, I, I need to make sure that I'm not mistaking my heartfelt loyalty for the strength of my rational position. Mm. You know, those are two different things. Not that they're unrelated, but, you know, I can't go, okay, well, I've got all of this loyalty to Jesus and that force is behind my reasoning. And it's not. Even I'm working on that yeah. as well. So in a sense, then your book is for everybody, isn't it? It's not just it for is. the believer. It's not just for the atheist it's, or even the agnostic. It's for everybody who, who would wish to engage in any kind of conversation like this to learn from and be more humble, really. Indeed. And, and that's a really good way of putting it. I mean, I think that's the bottom line. And to, do, and, and to have a humility that's mm. predicated upon not ignorance, you know, say, look, you know what, I don't, I've never studied this, so I don't know. So I'm going to hold it with an open hand, but it's, it's, it's more like, no, I, I've studied this. I understand it to an appreciable extent and I know where the uncertainty lies. And so I'm going to relax when it comes to those kinds of areas. And so I think it's, it's, so it's a, it's a humility that's born out of understanding and not just pure ignorance. Yes, there's something of the uh, college students' experience about this, isn't there? When you go to college and you go into the library to, to get the book that you particularly want to study and you, you look across the whole of the shelves and you think, I'm never going to know all that stuff. <laughs> it's quite a right. shocking kind of experience. But that, it that in itself is a learning experience, is it not? It, it is humbling. Oh, it yeah. is. You're totally right. I mean, that's. I think that's one of the most helpful experiences for well, for anyone, but, you know, the college student, I mean, that was the biggest learning how little I n- knew, but and not only that, l- learning enough to know where I did know some things and where I didn't, you know, to kind of avoid, you know, first of all, there's a vastness of knowledge yeah. and that you just kind of, that can overwhelm you. But then, you know, there are certain things that you come across every day and you're always dealing with and particularly, you know, science and morality and religion, and you just need to kind of know where the skinny branches are. Well, you have already mentioned skepticism, and you make a distinction in the book between full-blown skepticism, which I have to say I sometimes uh, encounter through emails sent to me. Um, right. <laughs> but, but you draw a distinction between that and what you call sober skepticism, which you say we should all embrace. Um, what's the difference? 
Yeah, I, th- I think the difference really applies to almost any issue. You know, what you're usually trying to do is avoid the two extremes on either side of the road that you're trying to stay on. So let's say we're on the epistemic road and we're driving and we want to avoid one extreme where you just you're gullible and you'll accept anything. But then you want to avoid the other extreme where you just you won't believe anything at all. You know, I I wish sober skepticism was something that was more exciting, but it really is just basically practicing safe epistemology. You're basically just using your cognitive faculties in the way that they were intended. And it will require the sifting. And there are certain things that you can believe. And then knowing the limitations of our mind and sense perception, you know, knowing the limitations of our cognitive faculties helped keep us on that road. And so the extreme, the uber skeptic, you know, you might get into a, you know, a postmodernist who says, not only can I not know anything, there's no truth at all. You know, they go from epistemological to a metaphysical conclusion. You go, whoa, whoa, calm down, you know, r- relax, um, <laughs> take a deep breath. It's not that bad. But then again, you have someone who just screams certainty all the time and thinks everyone who disagrees with them has horns, you know, and a pitchfork. And you go, you know what, that you need to take a deep breath too. And I think, you know, all of us are susceptible to falling into those two categories. You know, not just atheists, not just Christians, you know, we all are. So there's something you say of we sort of trust the faculties we have, that we should operate according to how we're supposed to be. Of course, that's a kind of theistic um, way of looking at things, which yeah, know, that is fair it enough. Is. We're speaking from a theistic perspective, so that's that's fine. But at the same time, not to well to bring back the same word to have a humility with respect to the use of those faculties. So as you say, it's a kind of balance between the two, and it's a good place to be, but not always a, a very easy place to be, especially if we're bombarded with various claims that we might just come across on the internet or the like. Yeah, I wish it were easier. I mean, it, 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 it's certainly staying on the road is is it's. A a precarious place. But go, going back to what you just said about the, um, you know, we're, we're theists so we can take certain things for granted about our cognitive faculties. Actually, in the book, that's a great, I, I'm glad you brought that up. In the book, what I do is I say, well, let's not take theism for granted. And let's look at our cognitive faculties. And one of the, one of the ways I do that is I go to one of my favorite unbelievers is uh, David Hume. And I don't do this by accident, and I don't do it. It's not just because I happen to like him. It happens to be – he happens to be probably one of the – he's kind of the the font of contemporary atheism, and rightly so. I think he was a brilliant man. And so I said, so let's see what Hume said, and let's see what it is to look at our cognitive faculties from a non-theistic standpoint. Absolutely. And this is one of the big things that you do in part one of your book, which is Sense and Reason. You look at Hume and you learn his perspective on things and how influential he has been. So could you tell us then more detail about why you chose to focus in on Hume? What was it about his empiricism that has uh, shaped the way things are? Yeah, I, he's just fascinating. I think more Christians should study him, more atheists should study him. Um, given his historical context, so you know, he lived in the 1700s. Well, in the 1600s, you have that's the big push of the scientific revolution. So you have Newton, and you have all of these great advances, especially Newton's Principia, and just an enormously impressive body of work. You know, just kind of unlocking the keys of the universe in many respects. And so there's this fervor and excitement and optimism that came from that. And uh, David Hume was, you know, he was one of the people who saw, look what Newton did. You know, look at this experimental method that he applied. Let's do that to the human subject. You know, Newton did it to the physical world, you know, the inanimate world. Let's do it to the believing subject, which is the most important thing anyways. So Hume tries this experimental method on basically himself. Let's look at our cognitive faculties. But he's responding to science. So he's saying, look how impressive science is. Let's apply it to humans. And then from that, he gets a little more than he bargains for because he realizes, oh, wow, there's like less, you know, he, and he's known for being this pretty ardent skeptic. So I think he's just a great test case for what I think atheists should do. I think, you, you know, in certain ways, be more like David Hume. And then 
David Hume ends up being one of the spokespeople for the European Enlightenment of the 1700s. Well, even the American Enlightenment, too. But in giving rise to Immanuel Kant, Kant's dealing with him. And anyways, he just is so influential. And so many of today's skeptics look to him at least superficially say, look, Hume has shown that the cosmological argument is worthless or the the design argument is an argument from analogy and that's bad, you know, whatever it is. And, and not that there's nothing to that. I think Hume does make some really good arguments against objections to get to those arguments, not decisive. Right. Yeah. So Hume is just such a great place to begin because he's the one giving cues to many contemporary atheists. Mm. But you say that uh, a lot of contemporary atheists don't go as far in their thinking as Hume. They they learn from him, they look back at him with great respect, but they don't go as far as Hume went. I mean, you you have a quote here from A Treatise in Human Nature. Let me just read it because it's a, quite a revealing few sentences. Where am I or what? From what causes do I derive my existence and to what condition shall I return? Whose favour shall I court and whose anger must I dread? What beings surround me and on whom have I any influence or who have any influence on me? I am confounded with all these questions and begin to fancy myself in the most deplorable condition imaginable, environed with the deepest darkness and utterly deprived of the use of every member and faculty. So that quote seems to give the impression that he you know, really struggled to try and understand reality and was coming to a position of despair, really. Yeah. And, and when, you, when you say it in the Queen's English, it sounds <laughs> like poetry. <laughs> just, just, just so you know, I got a little, I got a little distracted. <laughs> like, that's beautiful. <laughs> yeah, he would realize. Look, there's certain things that we just, you know, these are these big questions, and he would have these moments of maybe clarity where he'd say, "Look, you know, our epistemic situation is pretty sketchy." He calls it the whimsical condition of mankind. Mm-hmm. I I will say, like, there are some atheists, I think, who are also philosophers who do a really good job of learning from Hume. I I have in mind uh, a philosopher of science and a Hume scholar, Alexander Rosenberg. I mean, just fantastic philosopher. And he's I think he's one of the exemplars of an atheistic philosophy. And he really does take seriously some of these things that Hume learned It's like, look, Hume did learn that morality, you know, without any other grounding, just in human nature, morality is based on sentiment. You know, it's about feelings and preferences. Because you can't read it off nature. You can't observe it happening in in the world. Right. You don't. So what Hume says is, look, hey, you, you can observe a willful killing. He says, you know, someone kills someone willfully. But you don't ever observe that it's wrong. That's more of just a gut re- or reaction to a willful killing. Mm. And so he makes this distinction, and this is where his empiricism comes in, and I think it's just brilliant. And I th- again, I think there's a lot to Hume. You know, it's not like I, it, I, I should be clear, I don't take Hume and think, you know what, he doesn't have anything good to say, but because his entire philosophy leads to despair. I mean, I really do think that he's just got some great philosophy and that everyone can learn from it. And Mm -mm. anyways, going back to Alexander Rosenberg, I think he does a great job following him. You also bring up the issue in this section of evolution. So this is part one. Um, And you're not so much discussing as to whether evolution is true or not as explaining natural history, that kind of thing. You do touch on that. But it seems to me that you're you're exploring a question more like um, can a purely naturalistic account of evolution really give us much confidence in the reliability of our mental faculties, our cognitive faculties, and I detect planting very heavily there. Um, Can can you explain what the argument is here uh, and why you think most skeptics don't see that there really is an issue with this? So the the argument is basically, so suppose unguided evolution is the sober truth, and that's how our cognitive faculties came about. And, and, And you're right, this is just a Plantingian argument. You know, evolution cares about basically just behavior. Patricia Churchland says this too. I mean, just, you know, evolution cares about behavior. Mm. And so 
you need not have correct beliefs in order to navigate the world and find food and avoid danger and all, all of that. I mean, many organisms, actually most organisms do so just fine without beliefs of any kind, you know, I mean, viruses, they, they navigate the world and they'll, and they'll kill you, you know, they can kill us and they don't have any beliefs. They're pretty amazing organisms, highly complex. So if evolution only cares about behavior and that's only required, it seems like to have true beliefs is just kind of a luxury. I mean, that doesn't mean that it can't happen. And, and so the argument isn't that there's no way that it could happen. It's just look at the odd, you know, what are the odds of it happening given what we know about physics and chemistry and biology, that nature would go far above and beyond the call of duty and give us true beliefs. You know, it didn't need to do that. And, and it certainly we could survive just fine without them, um, given that kind of evolution. So anyways, it just, it's like, well, what are the odds of that happening? Right. And that's, that's really the argument. Thomas Nagel has, we, we don't need to stick with Planiga. We can go to Thomas Nagel and his mind and cosmos. He has, he thinks, look, there's, you know, given consciousness and given our current neo-Darwinian view, that's just, there's gotta be something different. And he thinks that we're just, I mean, he doesn't think that there's any sort of intelligent design. He thinks maybe, I mean, he's not even sure. I mean, what I like about Nagel is that he's willing to just go, well, it, Neo-Darwinianism in certain respects doesn't account for consciousness and other things. I'm not sure what does, you know, I mean, he's willing to say, I don't know. And I wish, I wish we could all do that more, you know? So yeah, you're right. I mean, it's pretty complicated. I don't, I don't know, but maybe one of the things he says, this is maybe one of the things is that there's something just fundamental about matter that's conscious, you know I mean? Like there's some sort of seed of consciousness in matter. It doesn't need to be, um, you know, I don't know. He did. And he doesn't, he doesn't say that that's, he thinks that's the truth. He thinks, well, maybe that's a likelihood or that's a possibility, not even a likelihood. And this is why you mentioned he got in trouble. This is why he got in trouble because he, he dared to even just ask that question. <laughs> Yeah, yes. yes, he went against the orthodoxy by, you know, by even asking such a question. Yeah. I mean, I am attracted to this line of argument. Um, I'm not convinced by the big story of evolution for a number of different reasons. And uh, I think this is quite a good argument. But um, I can't quite get out of my mind the kind of thing that Karl Popper talked about when he talked about his evolutionary epistemology. So the idea that natural selection does favor creatures that make correct decisions so decisions that fit the way reality is and so would that not suggest that our cognitive abilities have gradually been honed you know more and more to reflect the reality as it is because that, that's more successful you're selected for by natural selection right i, I just wonder whether plantiger's argument has quite answered that I'm probably bungling this, but I think what he would say is that what something like Popper's view does is just play on our strong intuitions that, and, you know, the fact that we have true beliefs, let's assume that we do, what Popper's argument does is play off the fact that, man, I'm just really glad I have, I'm able to be aware and have my beliefs connect to my behavior so that there's some sense of control, but as far as survival, you don't need that consciousness or the beliefs to behave in the right way and get your get the organism into the right location and perform the right functions to survive. And I think this is one of the interesting things. I could be wrong about this, but I think it's just it's interesting. We, there's so much that we're so used to. It's kind of like asking the fish about water. You know, it's it's really hard to get out of our, you know, just step outside and kind of try to think about what would it be like to not have beliefs and just could you really behave that way? Well, you could behave that way. It would just your conscious life would be entirely different and maybe even non-existent. So we're saying now to be sure you couldn't have your conscious life without these beliefs. You're glad that your consciousness matches up to your behavior but we take that for granted and we, it's such as we, we it's just amazing that there is that connection because many organisms and if you counted heads or amoeba or whatever most organisms don't have that connection so we're just taking this consciousness for granted and um it's nice and like you say gratuitous and a luxury but it's not necessary yeah 
And there is a sense, isn't there, that with evolutionary explanations, very often they do seem to be, well, they verge on the unfalsifiable. I, I believe that you know, Popper made points of, like this himself, that you, you're able to explain anything if you try hard enough, <laughs> because it has such a sort of dialectical structure to it, you know, the evolutionary theory, that it can pretty much cover anything you want to explain. Right. I mean, and, and I think that, and it, and it is, it's... On the flip side, to it could also be just seen, evolution could be seen as just, maybe it's not falsifiable, but just really, really a good explanation. I think that's where atheists would latch on and say, look, it looks unfalsifiable because it's such a large, you know, it can unify all kinds of phenomena into this single explanation. And I think that um, theists are going to do that same, something similar. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, let's move on. You have uh, this part two of your book, which you had science. Your first chapter is called Science Ruining Everything Since 1543, with a question mark, in which you say the title comes from a Saturday morning breakfast cereal comic strip. So I was deli yes. delighted with that. Um, <laughs> and uh, you say there's this popular view that sees science as gradually filling more and more gaps in our understanding of the world. And these gaps, and this is how the popular view goes, you know, they were previously filled by the explanation of God to fill all these gaps and so science is progressively pushing God out of the picture and then uh, let me quote from you now the undeniable success of science can make this line of reasoning seem pretty plausible but there are good reasons to doubt it many of them scientific so what are some of those good reasons why should we be suspicious of this perhaps simplistic narrative well I mean there, there are a number of, the, one, one reason is to just simply look at the history of science and the nature of scientific theories and it really goes back to this fundamental distinction between the things that we actually observe and then the inferences that we make from those observations. So there's a distinction between observation and theory. So we have all these observations and then we take that as data and form theories from that. Well, the theories are inferred. And when I say theory, it doesn't mean like, oh, they're just theories because even the fact that we're not, you know, let's say we have this theory that we're not hooked up to hooked up to the matrix or we're not brains and vats or whatever. That's a theory. I mean, no one's ever observed that we're not brains and vats. So when I say theory, I'm not downplaying a system. Yeah. I think that theories are, you can believe in them with your, with all your heart. Sometimes. And so anyways, this observation theory distinction and what we've had is we've found that given certain observations over time, you know, if you look at some of the scientific theories, there have been different theories that adequately, actually remarkably match up to observations that are so different from one another. So you have theory overturning theory overturning theory. So once you see the connection between observation and theory and the fact that there really are theories that help us technologically, help us to survive, help us to make, you know, iPhones or whatever that end up being wrong. Right. Is this what you mean when you say that theories are very often underdetermined by the data? Right. So you have multiple theories that can fit a given set of data. Right. When I say underdetermined or when philosophers say underdetermined, they mean that the data doesn't nail down or determine specifically one theory. Hmm. And you think, okay, maybe in, th in theory, maybe yeah. that happens in theory and logically, but it doesn't happen in practice. But if you look at the history of science, it actually happens quite a bit and more often than you would think. In fact, let's just take our best science. And forgive me, anyone who's not a physicist, let's say our best science is physics <laughs> and, yep. <laughs> and, and just wildly accurate. I mean, amazing. Well, in the two pillars of our current contemporary physics are quantum theory and general relativity. They're so accurate that it just seems absolutely unthinkable that they could be wrong. Yet there are certain cases where certain physical phenomena and certainly certain theoretical cases where, where they overlap, they contradict one another. So they don't agree. Mm. Well, that means at least one of them is wrong in some respect, you know, not wholesale wrong, but wrong in some respects. And 
that's why they're looking for you know, some physicists are looking for another theory to kind of unify those different phenomena that are different than general relativity and quantum theory. And that's one of the main contenders right now is um, string theory. So you see, even now we have kind of this, even our most accurate theories still need to be modified, updated, and maybe even just overturned. Now it's hard, you know, who knows how much will be kept and who, I mean, I, I certainly don't, and I don't, you know, maybe a lot of it will be kept, but scientists are now searching for a new theory of physics. You also have quite critical things to say of scientists such as Stephen Hawking and Leonard Mlodinoff in their book, The Grand Design, and Lawrence Krauss in his A Universe from Nothing. And uh, you take issue with Hawking and Mlodinoff's argument that the universe, I suppose we should say, or the multiverse, is ultimately explainable as the product of natural law. And you take issue with Lawrence Krauss's position that the universe kind of sprang into existence from nothing. (laughs) Or does he mean nothing? I don't know. (laughs) It's not quite clear. Um, Can you explain what your problem is with those kinds of statements? Well, uh, there's a lot. But I I guess one of the main problems is that there are philosophical statements that aren't read off of, that can't be read off of the science in any form. So let's say I wanted to read, you know, I say the universe or multiverse came from nothing. You know how I know? Well, because I'm looking at these natural laws, but the natural laws don't tell you anything about the nothing that was before. It just basically laws are just, I mean, I would say ontologically, there are no laws. They're just our descriptions of the way the universe behaves. So we have this way of the the universe behaves a certain way, but that's only how this universe behaves. It's not necessarily how the universe came into existence. That sort of behavior is just cut off. Like how do universes come into existence? Well, our current, our natural laws don't tell us that. I mean, mean, and, and they can't, they just, I mean, that's just something they cannot do. So what are, what are you saying? They're kind of smuggling in how we observe natural law operating in the world that we know. We, we see things operating according to natural law, and the smuggling is to say, ah, oh, well, that applies to, quote in quotes, you know, the beginning of the universe. And you're saying that's not really acceptable. Yeah, and that's, and that's one of the things that's not acceptable. The other thing is, I mean, there's always the, you know, first of all, there's just the big picture question, could you read off the origin of the universe from its current laws. I don't think you can, but then there's the problem of interpreting what those laws of, suppose it could, suppose laws of nature could tell you about the beginning. Well, it's not a slam dunk what the laws of nature say about the beginning. And part of that is because it's not clear what, I mean, the physics is just so beyond us at that point. And I don't mind people trying to, you know, surmise what, you know, here's a, here's a theory of the origins of the universe. I I don't, I don't mind that at all. What frustrates me is the, you know, the lack of cautiousness Mm -hmm. given that, look, I mean, scientific theories, they're amazing, but the stuff that you're trying to do with them, there's a lot of contortions that you're having to get into in order to make them say what you think they're saying. Which is fine. I don't mind that either. It's just more, just kind of acknowledge that. That's all I would ask. Mm -hmm. And so what about the Lawrence Krauss position where he seems to say that the universe can come from nothing? And yet he seems to talk about nothing as if it's not really nothing, as if it's something, but it's a something nothing. (laughs) Yeah, he goes, he actually goes through some stages where he first talks about nothing as empty space. And he, he makes some claims that, well, this is kind of what Plato thought. In which Plato didn't think that at all. Plato thought that space was this stuff. So I think he gets the he he stumbles over the concept of nothing. But towards the end, he does say, "Okay, well, let's not talk about space. Let's say, I mean, like nothing, nothing." And again, I you know something coming from nothing at all. I mean, that's been one of that really is a logical law. I mean, it's certainly conceptually, metaphysically, you'd have to have a good reason to think otherwise. 
Is this Parmenides ancient? I mean, I don't know if he actually formulated it, but is, is it not the case that he argued something along the lines of from nothing, nothing comes? You, you just don't get anything from nothing. Is that right? Well, Krauss is not no. arguing that. He's denying that. Sure. Sure. Yeah. And so he's just denying that age old. I mean, he, and he thinks it's just some idiosyncratic view of philosophers and that it's not a scientific principle and therefore it's false, which you'd like a little bit of argument for that. And he hasn't given one. Um, it just seems like he's just doesn't understand the concept of nothing, or at least maybe he doesn't understand the question. Right. And that, you know, if you have this quantum fluctuation of nothingness and out of which these multiverses come, that's a grammatical sentence, but I think it's void of any semantic content. Yes, that's right. Can you say that sentence again? Let's see if I can put the grammatical sentence together with some semantic content. Um, <laughs> so when you say that something can come out of nothing, I think that that, put it this way, well, I think what he, what he says is, um, you know, so there's the cosmos or the multiverse came out of quantum fluctuations of nothingness. And, you know, that certainly has a subject predicate and all of that. And there's this grammatical order to the words, but I don't think it has a semantic. Con I think it's meaningless, you know, given the a genuine concept of nothingness. Um, there's nothing to fluctuate in nothingness. Yeah. So it's really it, it kind of borders on. You know, I've I've seen a lot of bachelors who are married. You know, and it's like, well, that's certainly a grammatical sentence. And you could probably tweak it to where that made some sense. You know, it's kind of like square circle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's fascinating because a few months ago, actually, I came across a video of Neil deGrasse Tyson discussing the beginning of the universe with an eight-year-old girl uh, called Something From Nothing. And it was really revealing the way the girl was reacting to him. Let me just read a little bit of it because uh, it, it is quite nice, actually. So the girl says, uh, so before there was anything in space, how did nothing become something? I have an answer for that. And then she says, I've asked every scientist in the world and no one has answered it. And he says, uh, yeah, yeah, I have an answer for you. Ready? We have no clue. And she laughs. That's an answer, okay, he says. So, it's like, so far, so good. <laughs> she says, um, oh, it's, it's like a kid doing this. And so she shrugs. And he says, the difference is, often when a kid does this, it's because the kid doesn't know the answer, but maybe somebody else does. When I say we don't know, I'm talking about everybody who knows anything doesn't know. And we have top people working on that question. So another way to word that question is, how do we get something from nothing? The girl says, yeah. And then he carries on. But that kind of assumes we started with nothing. Maybe we started from something. Then she says, but then how did that thing create it? And then he says, uh, yeah, but suppose we started from nothing. Then I would ask you, how did we start with nothing? She says, it's, it's like, uh, was the chicken before the egg or the egg before the chicken? So he says, uh, well, so maybe you're the person who'll figure out how we got something from nothing or even how we got nothing from whatever came before because nothing is a thing. It's nothing. She pulls a face. <laughs> and then he says, uh, OK, so I can imagine a place where there's not even nothing. And so then that forces you to ask, how do you get nothing from that which is not even nothing? Then when you have nothing, how do you get something out of nothing? She makes another face and she says, it's very complicated. <laughs> uh, that, I feel like I'm trapped in a Lewis Carroll story. Yes. You do actually quote that in the book, don't you, through the looking glass? Yeah, yeah. In another context, yeah. but yes. I mean, this is one of the things that you say in the book that m many scientists will say, scientists of this ilk anyway, will say that they're, they're, they dismiss philosophy as being outdated and useless. And yet, actually, they're engaging in the business of philosophy themselves as they write their books. I mean, wh why do you think such highly intelligent people can make mistakes like that? Wow, that is an excellent question. I this is <laughs> I don't know, and some of my gut answer isn't charitable. So I, I I'm not sure. I it boggles my mind. I don't know if it's just an ignorance of philosophy and just reasoning in general. I think one of the things that I don't know. Here's here's one uncharitable interpretation. Not the most uncharitable though. You're trained to think in a certain way, and I remember being trained this way. Scientists are trained to think a certain way and you become very, very good at this one way of thinking in this narrow domain mm -hmm. that you really don't understand the bigger picture.
So you get really, really good. You're almost a virtuoso in this one area, but you don't see how it fits into all these other areas. And then so you deny, you know, it's like, let's say I'm such a virtuoso at piano. And then I just say, there's no such thing as there's no other instrument at all. There's only the piano. There's blinders that I think that goes with part of the training. Mm. Um, from your own experience, I mean, were you taught anything to do with the philosophy of science while you were being trained as a scientist and engineer? Not at all. Hmm. I've talked to so many different scientists and engineers. I mean, generally, we're not. I mean, that doesn't mean that some people don't think about these things, but there's such an enormous amount of information to be taught in a STEM, you know, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, the STEM education that you don't have time to slow down and talk. I mean, you just need to present the material. Here's science as it yep. is. Here's our best theories today. And it takes an enormous amount of work and effort to even become familiar with a fraction of it. Yep. So it's certainly understandable that you just don't. But I also think it's very dangerous because then you get these guys who have brilliant minds, and but they end up causing lots of trouble they're putting blockades in the way of a fruitful conversation. You quote Lee Smolin as saying that really we need scientists of a past era in a way in, the, in their approach to science. That we need uh, natural philosophers in the, in the classical sense, um, not the craftspeople or that we come back to the virtuoso image, not the technical virtuosos of, of today. I mean, something of this comes over in, um, I think it's one of your footnotes, actually. You say there's an article that you came across while you were writing the book by George Ellis and Joe Silk, and they're pointing out that some people in theoretical physics are actually called calling for very, very speculative theories about the universe to be accepted and for those theories not to be subject to experimental verification. And they were really concerned about this. And that also points to this narrowness that you've just been talking about and this sort of break from the classical view of what the scientist actually is. Yeah, it really is. And Smolin makes, you know, he's a physicist who knows his stuff. I mean, certainly someone who we should listen to. You know, he says that back when you have quantum theory and uh, general relativity being formulated, a lot of those scientists, they really knew their philosophy. I mean, they're doing philosophy of science. They're doing science. They're having to change. I mean, it's a, an enormous, it's a fascinating project that they had. And then after that kind of settled down, that revolution settled down, people got into just doing the, you know, you have people like Richard Feynman and they're doing the super technical work that probably the visionaries couldn't do, you know, I mean, they probably couldn't do that kind of have that virtuosity in mathematics and in physics and small and thinks now it's time, you know, we're in this crisis and we keep bumping up against this, we're hitting this glass ceiling and we need more visionaries to think outside the box now. And uh, a number of the theories that come up, certainly in the popular press, can seem quite extravagant and, and outlandish, um, especially when you look at things like the other front cover of The New Scientist, it'll be something you know quite eye-catching and, and counterintuitive. And you say that uh, a lot of people these days seem to be open to pretty much anything. And I think of that famous quote, I'm not sure who said it, but man will believe anything so long as it's not in the Bible. <laughs> um, <laughs> you say that we, we really need to be cautious about the bizarre claims that are made, but a lot of people are not cautious. We, we've lost that uh, in many cases, and people just accept, if, if something's spoken with authority, they will accept it. Why do you think people have become like that? Well, I think it goes back to the accuracy that these theories have had. You can't deny how accurate and precise our physical theories are. And so we think, oh, okay, wow, they're, if they're telling the truth about this and I can get a computer and an iPhone out of it, they can't be lying about these other things. And some of the other things that they tell us are absolutely crazy, you know, space curving, you know, not just things curving in space, but actual space curving or objects having a position but not a velocity at the same time. And you think, how, what? But it's hard to argue with success. And I think that's why we, they have some credibility. And yet there are things about some of the statements that are made that should tip us off, that things are not quite right. I mean, you 
talk about quantum theory, some people saying that there are certain axioms of logic that need to be put aside in order to make space for certain interpretations of quantum theory. Right. Um, that seems a remarkable thing to do and to just accept on authority. Right. Yeah, it is. And I mean, w- and once you start toying with laws of reasoning or just laws of logic, um, you, you start to wonder where the Somewhere in scripture, it says, if the foundations be destroyed, what shall the righteous do? You know, if you start toying with the axioms of thought, where do you draw the line? I mean, I don't, I mean, how about this? You know, there are certain laws of logic that are kind of, uh, they give us weird answers sometimes. And so I'm not saying that it's entirely crazy, but I do think it's really, you need to be really, really cautious if you're going to start toying with that. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so that's one thing that comes over throughout your book is this notion of caution with, with respect to all of our thinking. And I suppose, in a sense, I want to turn that on its head. You, you say we should have a sober view of science, along with sober scepticism generally, you know, realise the limitations of the scientific methods. You know, there are assumptions, science is provisional, etc., etc. It doesn't tell us everything about reality, even though it's, it's very, very powerful. So I'm going to turn that on its head. Isn't belief in God in exactly the same boat? Shouldn't we also be cautious about inferring the existence of God from what we experience in the world? Yeah, I think to particularly if you're going to infer God's existence from our current scientific theory, especially from the details of our scientific theories, like, you know, let's say we wanted to, so we get the Big Bang hypothesis from general relativity. Well, if general relativity, if it goes the way of all flesh or it's tweaked dramatically or whatever, you might not want to hitch your theological wagon to that scientific theory. Mm. I don't think that's wrong to do. I mean, I think what you could do is just say, hey, if Big Bang cosmology is true, then here's what it would imply about or here's a story that would fit with theism. But you'd have to have the conditional statement. You just need to be careful. And I think that's just what okay, – um, yeah. so in principle, on either side, I don't have – I think it's great fun to figure out, hey, what do our current scientific theories imply about all manner of philosophical issues? Mm-hmm. I'm going to pick you up on this, actually. Sorry about this. Sure, yeah. <laughs> um, but th- this, this is something that William Lane Craig does, of course. He does argue from – the current state of science and and builds arguments from that and says, well, you know, the best state of science implies uh, we can infer the existence of God or whatever. He argues for the existence of God. Um, You you don't exactly, I suppose you do slightly criticize him in the book, but I'm wondering whether you're fair about that because my understanding of what he does is that he is in fact putting that very if in his argument because I have heard him say, well, suppose the science goes in a different direction in future, that doesn't mean God doesn't exist. It just means that this particular argument turns out not to have been successful. So he's doing what you said, really. Gotcha. And Yeah. And if he does say that, then you're right. I've unfairly critiqued him. Um, I haven't gotten that feel for the stuff from the, I, I haven't come across that. Or if I did, I didn't read it very carefully. I certainly, the, the things that I've read by Craig seem to just take for granted. Um, but maybe he's, maybe he has been clear about that. And I've just not recognized it well i'm going to let you off the hook because i think that's his style actually because the first time i saw him do a presentation it was very much bullet point bullet point and i was actually quite impressed with the you know the rhetorical impact of that it was very very effective but i have heard him at other times qualify it so yeah gotcha okay well that's good to know that's good to know and the uh, the third part the final part of your book and we're not going to discuss this very much actually this is morality so you're not you're not looking at what particular things are right or wrong or whether people can be more or less moral depending upon their beliefs. You're not looking at that. It, rather, what is it that makes moral statements meaningful ultimately? And uh, you say in the final analysis that that is God. Now, we're not going to talk an awful lot about this because we did talk with Dr. Glenn Peoples a while back, so I'm not going to pursue a huge amount of this part of the book. I will encourage people to go and listen to that interview with Glenn Peoples. But you do insist on God as the foundation for morality, meaning and value, and you say that many people don't see that if it's true that God does not exist, then morality is pretty much 
an empty concept or little more than <laughs> which flavour of ice cream do you like? Um, so that's quite disturbing, actually, as a worldview position. Um, could you tell us how you argue that? Well, I, I start with just noting the, the nature of value. So when we say, um, so when we're talking about ethics or morality, we're talking about value in general. And there are other types of value, like aesthetic value, prudential value. But when you think about what sorts of things do we give the thumbs up to or the thumbs down to? Well, we give the thumbs down to willful killing in many contexts, right? So that's, we make it a value judgment. So when we say something is wrong, we're making a value judgment. Well, now we need to step back and say, and, and this is what I do. I say, all right, well, I look at the nature of value and I say, well, where is value grounded? Well, I say it's grounded in a valuer. So it really needs some sort of mind or intention for there to be any value. You can take gold, for example. Um, you know, what makes gold valuable? Well, nothing more than we value it. You know, if you were on a desert island and you were trying to survive and you stumbled upon a a cave, you know, you're starving and dying of thirst and you found a treasure chest full of gold, you'd be really disappointed. So it's it's really just the context. I mean, it's just really just a valuer that makes something valuable. So if we say murder is wrong and there's no ground other than just our you know human values, then it really is just dependent upon, and there's nothing more. I mean, you could say, well, the vast majority of valuers say down with murder. Well, that's fine. And I, and, but what you need to realize is that once you get to that point, it really is just, you're making morality is just, this is just the way I like, this is just goes with what, and this goes back to Hume, my sentiments. It's just my feelings, you know I mean? I, and there, there are people who don't agree with you. I mean, there like you have two people disagree on some morality, there should be some third thing that you're able to appeal to, to adjudicate their disagreement. Like there's got to be a right answer. Someone like Alexander Rosenberg, he's the atheist I mentioned earlier, who I think is darn consistent. You know, he says, look, there is no right answer. You know, thankfully though, most people are nice. So it's not that you can't live morally. It's not that you can't live according to the things you like. Well, of course you can. I mean, that, and that's what we all do. I mean, that's, there's no, no one would contest that. It's just the metaphysical issue of, well, remember, there's no right answer. So if you and I are arguing about morality, it's really us arguing about the color of the wall. You know, it's like, no, that's just looks, this looks better. And you're like, no, it doesn't. Uh, it does. And you, you want to say, well, okay, well, let's bring this other person in to adjudicate for us. Well, that person is just, you know, again, it's just another, there's no ultimate authority outside of human sentiment if there are only human valuers. So that final authority, that ultimate authority is God in your view. And of course, I agree with you. But this is why you say that God must be personal because of the nature of moral facts. They are grounded in a valuer. So there must be an ultimate valuer. God must be personal. Yeah. Well, how about this? Say, if we're going to keep an objective morality, like we, you know, if we're going to, if we're going to function and have a functional morality that we've had for, you know, millennia, then we would require that. Now, of course, you could be a revolutionary and say, you know what? Turns out that morality is not what we thought. And there are some people who will do that and just say, yeah, that really is preference. And, you know, thankfully, we all tend to agree that violence is bad. But you, you're saying in the book that in a way you you're encouraging people who don't believe in God to be more consistent in their views on this and to realize that to be consistent as atheists, they should take moral nihilism seriously and then presumably experience just how unsatisfactory that is as a, as a way of going about your life. Right. Well, I, yeah, I mean, I, I hope they would view it as unsatisfactory, but, you know, there's nothing constraining them to be unsatisfied. You know, it may be that they find that free. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, everyone's kept in check for now, but now I'm free of guilt. Now, of course, I would say as a Christian, I think that God's hardwired us to have this 
kind of, you know, we're hardwired with some of these laws in us. And so it's going to be, you have to really do some work to override those sentiments. Okay. So you, presumably you would argue then that we do actually have a deep, true intuition that there really is a difference between good and evil. Yeah. And I, insofar as, how about this? We have this indicator of what God values, mm. because that's all that it boils down to, you know, again, it's going to be in, in one sense, morality is dependent upon a valuer, you know, so it really does depend on what God values. Sure. Now you could choose to like that or not. And I think that gets a little unnerving, even to Christians to think that, you know, there's nothing in the fabric of the cosmos that's moral. You know, it's all subjective in a sense, in that you have a valuing subject. Mm -hmm. Yes, you say that it's uh, an error on the part of some Christians actually to go on and on saying that morality is objective, because that can give the impression that it could be read off in some sort of non-personal way, perhaps lead in the direction of platonic um, realities uh, that are just out there in some sort of mathematical space. But by saying it's subjective, it's, it's relative to a valuer, you get away from that problem. Yeah, and that's and you got to be very, very careful. This is what this is one of the big things that people are uncomfortable with when I say that morality is subjective. And in one sense, it's objective in that it's human independent, right? And that's usually what people yeah. mean. Yeah. You know, there's this objective morality in that it's not just determined by human values. So, in that sense, traditional objective morality, fine. Yeah, that's that's I agree with that. But ultimately. I think it's helpful to remember that it's based on someone's values in that person's values alone. And that's God's values. I did actually find that helpful. When I first read it, I was a little uncomfortable in exactly the way you've just described when you started saying, well, it's not objective, it's subjective. I was thinking, oh, well, just, just, just a minute. Yeah, right. there are, surely there are objective moral values. But when you explained it more, then, as, as we've just been talking, then uh, that, that made a lot of sense to me. I think it was really helpful. Now, of course... It's obvious from our discussion here that you've covered an enormous amount of ground here. And I think it's been really, really helpful what you've done in the book. So the last thing I want to ask you is, what would you say is the essential boiled down take home message of this book? You know, you've covered a lot of ground. You've made it easy to digest. You've got plenty of examples, choice quotations. I love your quotations in there and loads of humor. You, you've got even cartoon strips with dinosaurs speaking to each other. <laughs> um, you've, dealt, you've dealt with this mass. So boiling it down, what essentially do you want people, whoever they are, whether they're believers, unbelievers, to come away with at the end of reading your book? I want, perhaps I just want them to see what an atheistic world looks like and then just be upfront about it. And then once we can see, all right, here's what atheism looks like. Here's what theism looks like. And then we can, again, this is, this is how I see an atheistic worldview and that's going to be part of the conversation. But I would, I just think the atheists look at the world as much kinder and gentler than it really is. If what they think is true, if what, if theism is false. Well, it's a fascinating challenge. Um, not an easy one all the time to think about, but I think you have made it, as I say, very approachable. Thank you ever so much, uh, Mitch, for coming on the show. I really enjoyed the conversation and uh, the book also. Um, I think it is very effective. It's a useful, I'll call it an antidote to the many exaggerated claims about the supposed conflict between science and religion. So um, thank you ever so much for coming on the show. It has been fantastic to speak to you. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And I will just say before we close that the book, of course, is available from Crossway, which you can find at crossway.org. Thanks very much. Great to speak to you. Thank you. Thanks, Julian. <laughs>